This morning, we're going, I prepared something a little bit different for you. Some of you are very good note takers, and I see you out there scribbling away, unless you're drawing pictures of me. I don't know. There could be that possibility I just thought of. But either way, I'm, I'm assuming that you're taking notes. And there's, because there's a few people that have commented that they'd like to uh, get the notes off my slides, all of them. And so what I've done is I printed off my slides. And in case you want them, they're up here laying. And so they're available after the service, not before the service. So um, I'll try to do that. Depends on how many are taken, whether I keep on doing it or not. So it's up to you. You're going to vote by how many of these are taken. So there it is. I'm going to kind of move along through my slides. So you're not going to be able to record all these things on your on your notes, so don't, don't just try to get the, the main points, and if you need any more details, take the hand out. Father's Day. I wish that I could credit myself in saying this, but somebody said this, that fathers, are, fathers fight dragons almost daily. They hurry away from the breakfast table off to the arena, which is sometimes called an office or shop, and they don't quit, or they don't quite win the fight, but they never give up. Fathers make bets with the insurance companies about who will live longest. (laughs) Fathers are what give daughters away to other men who aren't nearly good enough so that they can have grandchildren who are smarter than anybody's. (laughs) No, I've got the greatest son-in-law in the world, so I don't have any problem there. And then lastly, most unique, a father is a man who reflects the image of his heavenly father, and who makes it easier for his children to know their heavenly Father. And so is that, that, that's a good challenge, even that right there in, in that quote. Uh, that's what's being said. I'd like to piggyback off of the last two messages that I had, and I realize that some of you have not been here for that. But what I did is I, I challenged people to grow deeper in their spiritual life. To have that intimate, intertwining relationship with God. Are you about doing that? Have you thought about that? Have you really been more intentional about doing that? I'm not talking about gaining more biblical knowledge. I'm talking about growing deeper. Deeper. That intimate, growing relationship. And that happens on a daily basis. That happens on a, a, throughout the day in your relationship with Him. Is it growing deeper? We talked about last week where one of the benefits of that, growing deeper in that relationship, is the wisdom, the godly wisdom that comes out of that. And through that godly wisdom, we can find, we can find a life that has been prospered, prosperous, that has been blessed of God, truly blessed of God. Guys, are you a blessed man We're going to be talking about what that is, because as we turn to the passage this morning, Psalm 112, we're going to see this psalmist where he talks about the blessed man, a truly blessed man, and what that is. And it's not talking about, he's not talking just about the the physical things of the world, but he's talking about other things too. Adversity, for example. There's blessings in adversity. So if you, turn, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 112, and if you're borrowing the chair Bible, it is on page 509. And let me just read to you this psalm, because I, we need to capture what, what the psalmist is communicating to us in a full way first. The psalmist says, Praise the Lord! Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in His commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady, and he will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He is distributed freely. He has given to the poor. 
His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desire of the wicked will perish. To understand this verse, I, I, to this chapter, we need to really focus on verse 1. And I want to just spend a few minutes looking at this verse. There are three things that I want you to see in, just in verse 1 itself. And after verse 1, it sets up the body of the, the psalm itself. Notice the very first words. Praise the Lord! <laughs> it's the position of the heart of this blessed man. Not just at the end of his life, he says, praise the Lord, but throughout his life. At the end of each day, as Casting Crowns has a song, at the end of each day, do I, do I sign your name to it? <laughs> I love that song. Are you the man that, that says that at the end of the day, praise the Lord? Now, I'm not talking about the circumstances around us because there are some nasty things that happen throughout the day. Some things that really, it just kind of sets us kind of wrong in our life. We don't like it. But we trust God, and even throughout the day, we can say, praise God. He's doing something significant, and even at the end of this day, I will say, praise the Lord. This is the position of the blessed man. He focuses his entire being on Him, and he sees everything from God. Secondly, in this verse, we, we see that uh, this man fears the Lord. We, we know those, those words from the book of Proverbs. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And if you want to be a, a if you want to be a, a blessed man, you need to begin with fearing the Lord. What does fearing the Lord mean? But is to stand in awe, to revere Him. He lived out daily in his life. He fears the Lord, and that is the beginning of being that blessed man of God. And then at the end of that verse one, he also talks about the third thing I want to point out to you. He, he greatly delights. In the Lord's commandments. That is his position in life. He has grown in his relationship with the Lord so much so that he not just fears God, but he, he wants to know what the commandments of God are. And he wants to, and he wants to live his life in that way. As a matter of fact, he's gotten to the point where he delights in them. And even though the world is tempting around him and he wants to do this or do that, or maybe the pressure of the world, pressure caves in around him, he, he pushes them aside. And he delights in the law of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord. He saturates his, his presence with the Lord. And he, his life is obedient in every direction. He reflects God's nature. Grace. Good understanding. And he not only ponders the work of God with great delight, but he applies himself with equal delight to know God's will. That's a man that's really fixed upon God, that fears Him, that pursues Him in his life. And, and through that, there is an outpouring of his life. Verses 2 through 9, the psalmist talks about the, the outpouring of his life, the blessings of this man. And there are five things that I want to point out to you, and we're going to kind of rapidly shoot through them, so don't try to get every word. First of all, righteousness. It's, it's measured in Old Testament terms here, and he talks about different things here. He, he talks about the general rule of children being the product of who he is. And now that's not always the case in 100% of the time, but it's a general rule. You want to know how a man lives his life? Look at his children. Sometimes it's scary. And you men, you ought to be able to, when you see your children, it's like looking in the mirror. You want to know how they got to be so ornery? <laughs> You want to know why they're so argumentative? You know, you're looking in the mirror. Maybe you are much like that. And so the righteousness in his life, the, his very, the things that he, pursue, he pursues after the righteousness, and he wants righteousness more than anything, that is, the, that is the, the, the product of God that he's chasing after. And as he does that, he is producing a godly generation after him. Wealth and riches are in his house. What is that? I like what Charles Spurgeon has to say about what the, those riches are. The riches of the Christian. Contentment. Peace. Security. Power and prayer. Promises. Providence. And yea, God Himself. 
Of course, he's from the 19th century. That's why you get that yay stuff going on. <laughs> We're not talking about a hefty bank account. We're not talking about God's pouring on, onto you. I'm seeking after God, and right away I check my, my, uh, my balance on my checking account, and boom, a million dollars. Man, I'm blessed. <laughs> I'm blessed with God. And man, I have, I have a house, and as a matter of fact, I have two or three houses, or I have one or two or three cars in my driveway. I must be blessed of God. <laughs> But that's not the blessing that the psalmist is looking for. He's looking for a a heart that's been truly blessed by God. Something in which the world can never afford to give. The world can afford to give you cars and all of those material things, but there's something that the world can't give you that only God can give you through that blessing. Contentment, peace, security, all those things here that Spurgeon mentions. Secondly, He gives us adversity. Adversity. There's something very special about adversity. And in this psalm here, the the darkness is a metaphor for adversity. Difficulties. Guys, we have them, don't we? And maybe more times than we care to even want to talk about. Pressures of life bear down. And let me tell you something. As we go on, it gets more and more difficult. I'd like to tell you that it gets more that it gets easier, that life gets easier, or then your, your children's generation will get easier, but it keeps getting more difficult. Age doesn't make it easier. Life continues to push on the man of God. And here he uses this metaphor of darkness. Adversity comes around this man. And we don't like that, but yet there is a product that happens that only comes through adversity. Through his godly wisdom, the life of godly wisdom, there is joy of life that reveals itself. The dawning of the joy of life. Some of you um, have not yet grown up to where you can get up early enough to see the dawning of light. And if you have, you know that there's a special glow about the sky, isn't there? It's all dark out, and then you look out the, do- the door and to let the dog out, and, and all of a sudden you see that we have, we, when we let the dog out, we face the east, and we can see the, we can see the, the light rays coming out, coming up over the trees, and it's just brilliant. It's wonderful. And yet, we would not appreciate that if there wasn't the darkness, right? And it's, so it's a dawning in this dark, in this man's life. He goes through a period, he might go through a period of, of difficult times. But yet there's that dawning, the, the rays of the joy of life that all of a sudden appears. And how grand is that when that happens? Oftentimes, fathers may wonder why God allows brokenness to happen, but it is only through those broken times others can see what truly is on the inside. Your kids, your spouse, the people around you need to see that godly man that you are. And sometimes it's hard to see that until we get broken open. And then, through those adversities, And then we can see the quality of man that's there. And as he walks through those difficult times, there is a quality of man that we need to learn from. So there is a great blessing in adversity. And then number three is discretion of life in verse 5. He knows how to deal graciously and justly because he finds delight in God's commands. There's no great wisdom in this world. People search for wisdom, but yet they find none. Riches won't get you there. Only God's commands and walking in that can give you the gracious and just conduct in life. As you deal with others, as you encounter other people, that comes, that's a blessing that God gives you through His commands. And so we need to understand that it only comes through God. And the fourth one is is established heart. It's established heart. That's great. Wonderful. He has no need to wander because his hope, his purpose, his understanding is found permanency. The kids don't have to worry about how dad's going to handle that situation. They'll watch you go through difficult times. They'll watch you go through things when people are in your face and they're bearing down on you and they're actually pushing you into the ground. They'll watch you go through those things. But they don't have to worry. Is dad going to knock his lights out? (laughs) Is is dad going to really, is he going to bash his car in? Well, how's dad going to respond? They don't have to worry. 
There's a man that has an established heart. Somebody that has fixed their heart, their hope squarely on Christ. And he, and, and he, he doesn't need to wander anywhere. His purpose is pursuing Him. It's found a permanency. His hope has found a resting place, as the hymn says. Also, he knows that bad news will come. Yet his heart has no, has, is not alarmed because he surrounds himself with the guidance of God throughout his life. God's got it all in his hands. God's got him on track. And I'm pursuing God. And I know that the difficult times are coming. They're coming. They're, they can't be avoided. And it may happen today when I've got to face maybe the worst news of my life. But yet he keeps hold. He keeps hold of God's, God's commandments. He keeps hold of chasing after Him and trusting Him with His life. God's going to guide him through this day, through this life. And then lastly, it's a, it kind of a redundant one, if you may look at it for face value from the first one, the righteousness. But here we have a little bit nuance of, of what the psalmist is trying to say here. It's very, this man, his, his conscience, his conduct, has a lasting success to it. In his very being. We don't have to worry, is he an explosive? Is he, is he a man that lives right on the edge? And I've talked about those types of, of attitudes these days when you, people are going down the road and you don't have to do much. All you have to do is sway a little bit and, and they get all over you and blow your horn and make all kinds of gestures to you. You don't have to worry about this man. His, he, he, is, he is through and through a man that pursues after God. His conscience, his conduct is a lasting success that we see throughout his life. And it's, and it's a goodness, it's a quality of goodness that expresses itself in generosity with all of his resources. Some of you have displayed that very characteristic. That, that way of, of just sharing and, and using your resources in whatever way possible because this is the life that God has given to you. He's given you these things not to hoard, not to hold on to. We have multiple things, and you can't have any of those because if I give you one, then I'm going to be down to six, and I can't do that. <laughs> Exaggerating just a little bit. But yet the reality of it is also true. I have excess because God has given me excess to share with you, to give to you. And in that godly man, that is the way that he uses his resources. The psalmist talks about the horn. It's a, it's a metaphor for strength and might. His strength, this godly man, blessed of God, his strength of godliness is honored and is exalted. His strength is in God, in God alone. And so this morning, I'd like to just kind of pull this into, uh, just as we pull this into just a, an application I want to point out to you this last, last verse when he contrasts the unblessed man. The unblessed man. Who is he? The Bible calls him wicked. Someone that wants nothing to do with God. And he may have the empty riches of this world. He may have the houses. He may have land. <laughs> Wonderful. He may have all those worldly riches. But he's bankrupt of God's reward of righteousness. Don't be deceived. Because you have material things, don't think you're blessed of God. You could be, but it's not always the case. The wicked see that. They, the wicked see the truly blessed man of God, the contentment. And you could see that in some people's faces. Isn't that amazing? I love that. I don't know what my face looks like. I don't, I'm afraid to look. <laughs> Is there contentment? Is there peace? Is, is there really satisfaction with God? Maybe He's given you a hut to live in, or no house at all. <laughs> is there contentment there? Are you, are you trusting in the Lord? The wicked see that. You may have nothing, and they may have everything, but yet you are more content, because you are blessed of God. The psalmist says they see that contentment, they see that blessing, and they gnash their teeth. They're so angry with you. You've got nothing and you're, you're happy. And I've got all of this and I'm still not happy. And I still want more. They fill themselves of this world. And it satisfies them in some sort of way. Because it's self-seeking. This world and those ungodly people are self-seeking. 
and the world rewards them with more material things. And so they're kind of happy in that way, but yet they're not content. They want more and more and more. It's, a, it's an appetite that they just can't settle, and they never find the peace of God. But yet they refuse to, to leave those things and surrender their life to God. This world rewards them for that self-seeking life that they live with more stuff. But yet, they grow uncon- just not contented in anything. So now we have the blessed and we have the unblessed man. So I want us to think about this in this application. Are we living under the, the pretense of being blessed by God? Thanksgiving time comes around and you go around the table or you hear people on television. Uh, let's talk about the blessings. You know, how are we blessed? And what do they talk about? They talk about Anything. You just name it. Right on down a lot. Maybe even children, that sort of thing. And boy, don't we live a blessed life. We are blessed in this country. We are more blessed than anything. (laughs) Are we really blessed in this country? Or are we really getting what we deserve? We talked about Saul in Sunday school. The Israelites got what they wanted. But in the end, they were bankrupt of God. Anyway, that was a side note. That was no charge for that one. Are we really blessed of God? Or are we just blessed of the world? The, war, the world continues to give us more of themselves, of more of itself, and it's, and it's based upon the self-centeredness. Have it your way. You deserve it. You deserve it. Come over here and we're going to pamper you. We're going to give you everything you do deserve to get. And we give you, and meanwhile they're reaching around pickpocketing and you... <laughs> But the world blesses people with material possession, possess, possessions. And, and yet God does too. Sometimes. And sometimes He doesn't. But the way that God really does bless a person is in the heart. The heart. So how do you live out your life? How do you live out your life? We talked about three Sundays ago when we started that new series. Are we pursuing a life with God in the center? Or is it a self-centered life? There's really quite the difference, the contrast. You're either doing one or the other. The self-centered person continues to pursue after what he wants. What I want. And you better do what I say or you're going to have problems, buddy. (laughs) And they push people around until they get it. Is that how people would view you? If they were really honest about it? Or do they see something of much better quality? Something that's really been blessed of God, that only God could do that work in your heart. Your funeral will tell that, but you won't be around to hear it. (laughs) I've seen them. I've seen them in funerals. I've seen the people, and I've even right here, since I've been here, I've conducted funerals at the, the funeral home, and I'm thinking of one person in particular that some of you don't even, may not even know. In the family, and it was, it was a full house. And then when I was there, I was listening to people talk about, I give people an opportunity to talk about this loved one here. No, it wasn't here, it was over there. And, and I was listening to what they were saying. And it was a very shallow life. There was no depth. It was a, it was a rather wayward person on God's scale. And yet they kind of scrambled for talking, talking about some food that she fixed or some, some other, thing, other qualities of, of just, you know, treating them as children, grandchildren, whatever it was. And, and yet, it was there, there's no depth of life in that person. How did that person really, really make a difference in that person's life? Your children will tell on you. Or the people, maybe if you don't have children, those, that spouse or those people that's closest to you. How do you live your life? How will it be remembered? How? I don't know if you, ever, if you knew this man here by the name of Alan Redpath. He's been gone now for some time. But Alan was a, uh, actually he was a pastor of uh, Moody Community Church in Chicago, Illinois. For some, for some years. Godly man. 
many people has been blessed through his ministry and lives have been changed. Godly man. And he to- tells about a time in his childhood growing up when, as he would say, there was, it was a period of uh, intensity, <laughs> putting it mildly, in his house. And I don't know what went on there, but he remembers during this period of time they were gathered around a dinner table and he was, I don't know how old he was, eight, nine, ten, I don't know. And they were gathered around the table and the husband looked up and he looked over at his wife. His dad looked over at his mother and says, I'm so sorry for the way I I treated you and the way I behaved. And with that humble spirit, he asked for forgiveness. And that made such an impact on that young man, that, that young boy, that, that later that day, that later that evening, he went off to his room and he was contemplating what he just saw in his dad. And he, Although uh, Alan Redpath said he wasn't a Christian at the time, he got down on his knees and he prayed this. Oh God, I thank you for a father like that. Please, make me more like him. Is that what your children say about you? When they get down on their knees, does he say, wow, God, <laughs> would you deal with him? Would you take the anger out of that man? Would you, well, I don't want to be anything like him. And when they get out of the house, they, they, they try to be so much different than their dad. Or they like Alan Redpath, where his dad made it easy. He demonstrated Christ-likeness. Even when he had a big dish of humble pie that he ate, he bent his knee and he asked for forgiveness from his wife. Is that what you're displaying to your children? We had three men up here this morning. Three men that asked, that decided to go this road. They stood before you. You saw them up here. They led their families up here. And they continue to lead their families. We need to pray for these men. They are going to have pressure like you and I, perhaps, older ones, have never faced before. This culture continues to bear down on them very heavy. And may they, t- they take stands, and maybe they do things, uh, they follow God's Word, and maybe people laugh at them, snicker at them, say things to them. But yet they are committed to following God. This place should be a refuge for those men. They need to come here, instead of criticizing them, maybe like the world does, we need to surround them and say, what can we do to help? Listen, Mark. Listen. Listen, Dan. Listen, Ian. We're praying for you guys. It's not easy. It's difficult. And whatever I can do to surround you, to help you, what can I do? What can I do to help you guys? We need more godly men that will stand up here and pledge their life, their parenthood, to to leading their children such as Red Pass Dad? Will Will your children get down on their knees and say, God, thank you for a father like that. Make me more like him. I urge you men, you fathers, to be a man of God like that. Let's stand, and I want to close this in a word of prayer. Don't forget there are handouts of the slides up here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for the day. Lord, what a great day that it is. Thank You for the beautiful, just the beautiful weather and just an opportunity to, to do special things with our fathers. Maybe some of our people here this morning, maybe they don't have their earthly father with us anymore, with them anymore. But as they reflect upon the person that He, that he was, just give them grace. Help them have fond memories and help them, encourage them in the way that they need to go. Making their own life, even if they are more up in age, God, help them to be more godly. To help their children, their grandchildren, to be the godly men and women that they need to be. Oh God, we need You more now than ever in this world that gets darker and darker and darker. And we ask that You would just glorify Yourself in and through the lives of of these men and these fathers. And we pray all this in the great name of Jesus. Amen. You're